In a small farming village in northern Mexico, a 14-year-old boy notices some lights in the distance. He approaches and hears what sounds like a mix of screaming and human and animal groaning. He gets closer and hides behind a rock, only to witness a terrifying human sacrifice ritual, culminating in the victim's heart being extracted from his body while he's still alive. The young boy bolts and runs nearly 10 miles to the nearest police station. Police laugh at the boy, assuming he's either confused or mentally challenged. But feeling that they have no choice, they tell the boy they'll return him to his home in the morning and stop by the location of the alleged ceremony. The boy and the officer would never return. And what police discovered when they went to search for the missing boy and officer would expose a heinous story that still shocks to this day. Welcome back to Crime A to Z, where we detail cases and criminals from their very beginning until well after other reporting ends. Today, we'll be talking about a case that we began to question the moment we heard of it. Such a wild and far-fetched story certainly couldn't be true. And we became even more skeptical when there was seemingly little documentation related to the case. But after finally finding actual reporting from the region during the time the incidents occurred, it turns out that this incredible story is, in fact, true. So stick with us to see how desperation, bad people, and a completely delusional prostitute resulted in the case that's beyond belief. Yerba Buena is a small communal farming village located near the Tamaulipas border at the foot of Mexico's Sierra Madre Mountains. In 1962, the village was home to fewer than 20 families and about 75 people in total, all of whom were imported from central Mexico to develop farms in the region. With the community having been recently formed 20 years prior to that, there was no formal government, no law enforcement, no church, and no school. The community chose their own governing council, set their own rules, and lived a simple, peaceful life selling corn and beans to the government. It was both the size of this small town as well as the people's poor, desperate existence that attracted two scam artists. Santos and Cayetano Hernandez were two brothers with a history of committing petty crimes. They would travel throughout Mexico scamming people out of their money. Eventually, they came up with the idea of starting a cult to convince people to give them money. Their target, the small village of Yerba Buena. Recognizing that the village was uneducated, poor, illiterate, financially desperate, and had a practically non-existent presence of police and public services, they set their sights on exploiting the vulnerable farmers. The pair considered the villagers easy prey, and they were. The brothers arrived, called all the people of the town to the center of town, and playing off of Incan mythology, they claimed themselves prophets of an ancient Incan god sent to recover gold hidden in the mountain caves centuries earlier. They claimed that the gods would soon return to punish the heretics or disbelievers, but that true believers would be rewarded for their devotion with great wealth, once the gods led the self-proclaimed prophets to the treasures. Their story aligned with the stories that had been passed on from generation to generation throughout the region of ancient gold and treasures being hidden in the mountains. But what the people didn't realize was that the Incas were from South America, not Mexico. This tie-in to ancient folklore along with some sleight-of-hand tricks the brothers performed to demonstrate their supernatural powers helped convince the unworldly villagers that these were, indeed, prophets from the ancient gods. With the townspeople desperate and seeing this as their only way out of poverty, they agreed to follow the so-called prophets. They handed over the small amounts of money they obtained from selling whatever was left over from their small corn and bean crops. But the brothers were immediately dissatisfied with the paltry gains. So they soon demanded that the women and children of the village become their slaves. And when they became bored with that, the men became required as well. They also convinced parents that it was the will of the gods that their underage daughters be sent to neighboring villages to be prostitutes, earning additional money for the brothers. The brothers' early cult practices involved gathering in the cave every few days to partake in large amounts of marijuana and peyote, an animal sacrifice, and orgy. Then, after a year of these sacrifices and forced orgy, the people of the village started to be annoyed and skeptical, having not had a single discovery of any gold or treasures. 
So the brothers decided to take their deception to the next level to convince the townspeople once and for all. They told the villagers that they were going to summon an Incan princess to prove their validity. Then they set off to the neighboring city of Monterey looking for a worthy accomplice. They hoped to find a prostitute who could pose as a female deity. It didn't take long before they encountered Eliasar Solis, a pimp. He said that he knew the perfect candidate, his sister, 18-year-old Magdalena Solis, who had been forced into working for him as a prostitute since she was 12. She was no stranger to scams. Growing up in poverty, to earn money, she would often pretend to be a fortune teller with the ability to channel spirits of the dead. She was the ideal candidate to play a part in this high-level scam. So, Magdalena and her brother agreed to accompany the brothers back to Yerba Buena to participate in the swindling of the village. When they arrived back in Yerba Buena, the show was on. They gathered all the followers in a cave one night and promised that the goddess Coatlicue would appear if they completed this summoning ritual. They'd watch the brothers drain the blood from a goat again and again. The villagers grew tired of the ritual. But this time, it was different. Once the goat was drained, Magdalena's brother, Eli Asur, was introduced as the high priest of Coatlicue. He approached the altar and chanted some incomprehensible cantations. Then smoke appeared. The brothers had used flash powder to create smoke and the aura of mysticism. Once it dissipated, a woman in full regalia and headdress emerged. They presented her as the Incan high priestess that they had been waiting for. The naive people saw the smoke and immediately dropped to their knees to worship the living goddess presented to them, begging for their salvation. But fooling the townspeople turned out to be even easier than they thought it would be. And it was easy for Magdalena to fall into the role. What would prove to be harder would be Magdalena falling out of the role. Fueled by her peyote, enhanced delusions, and her newfound position of power, Magdalena quickly displaced the Hernandez brothers in stature. No sooner than Magdalena was presented as the high priestess, she soon began actually believing that she was the high priestess. And with that, she escalated her expectations of the people and the rituals. To start, the drug use and animal sacrifices increased. Then she commanded that the followers engage in incest, bestiality, and pedophilia, drawing satisfaction from watching. Followers were also required to give her a portion of their meager earnings, possessions, and food. And as the events and commanded actions became more and more gruesome and sadistic, two villagers in particular began to voice their concerns. Magdalena immediately labeled them heretics for their skepticism and swiftly instructed the other villagers to lynch the two dissenters. And they did, beating the two villagers to death in front of Magdalena. From that point on, the wild orgies and animal sacrifices became merely a basis for Magdalena's own ideas of what the sacrifices and rituals should look like. Drawing on Aztec mythology, which claims that human blood is supposed to sustain the gods' immortality and prevent the end of days, Magdalena introduced human sacrifices to their rituals. It's unclear whether the first human sacrifice volunteered or whether a dissenter was forcefully sacrificed. But most reports point to Magdalena sacrificing anyone who showed opposition to their practices. One report does claim that once Magdalena called for a second volunteer to be sacrificed, one of the villagers had had enough and went to police. But since Magdalena continued her reign for months afterward, that account is unconfirmed. Magdalena also introduced bloodletting, or the draining of blood from the body. In all, the full ceremony that took place for any dissenter included brutally beating, burning, cutting, and dismembering them, then slitting their skin and draining their blood. She would then mix the drained blood in a chalice with chicken blood, marijuana, and peyote. She would drink the mixture, then pass it on to the priests, then it rounds the villagers to drink. The villagers were told drinking the blood would give them magical powers, probably not a far stretch to believe given the drugs the blood was laced with. By this time, Magdalena, now called the High Priestess of Blood, was in full control. The Hernandez brothers had no authority or control over her, or what was happening. They, in fact, became her followers. They fully integrated her sadistic rituals and any other of her commands into the official rituals. So whenever new dissenters were identified, the villagers would take turns beating, cutting, and dismembering these human sacrifices to please the High Priestess. And then, she took it to the highest level. 
Once Magdalena grew bored of the beating, burning, mutilating, and bloodletting, they began using a special ceremonial dagger to cut their live victims still being hearts right out of their chests. By 1963, the human sacrificing of any dissenters had been going on for about two months, which is when young Sebastian Guerrero happened upon the gruesome acts. In May of 1963, 14-year-old local resident, Sebastian Guerrero, notices lights in the distance as he's out and about one evening. As he gets closer and closer to the cave, he can hear screaming and moaning. Once he reaches the cave, he hides behind a rock so he can observe what was happening inside. It was the final stage of one of Magdalena's brutal human sacrifices, culminating in the removal of their heart. As the lifeless sacrifice lay on the stone slab, Sebastian witnessed half of the villagers ascend on it with their machetes, dismembering it and draining and drinking its blood, while the other half of the villagers engaged in a massive orgy on the other side of the cave. He runs 10 miles to the nearest police station in Villabrin Tamaulipas. Exhausted, he arrives and tells them, a group of murderers who prey on ecstasy who were gluttonously drinking human blood like vampires. The police do not believe him and try to dismiss him. But despite their disbelief, they allow one officer, Luis Martinez, to accompany the young boy back to his home the following morning, also agreeing to go to the site where he had supposedly seen the vampire activity. The boy and the officer left the following morning. And that was the last time the two were ever seen alive. Once the police realized Officer Martinez had not returned, they suddenly took the matter seriously. They sent a more significant group of police along with a small military detachment to the cave. They searched the area, ultimately discovering the cult. A shootout between the cult members and the police and military ensued. A number of the cult members were killed, including Santos Hernandez, who was shot by police, and Cayetano Hernandez, who was found to be killed prior to the standoff by Jesus Rubio a villager who caught onto the scam and demanded a piece of the action for himself. Police would find a total of eight cult members' bodies that had been killed by the cult. They also found the dismembered remains of young Sebastian and Officer Martinez, the latter of whom had had his heart extracted. By the time it was over between the cult killings and the shootout, 16 villagers were killed. Magdalena Solis and her brother Elia Sar were both arrested, along with 12 cult members. Both Magdalena and Ali Asar were tried in Ciudad Victoria. Members of the cult, most of whom would end up being convicted themselves, refused to testify against their leaders, so the prosecution was not able to confirm Magdalena or Ali Asar's participation in the eight cult member murders. They were, though, charged with the murders of 14-year-old Sebastian Guerrero and Officer Martinez. Magdalena and Ali Asar were convicted and sentenced to 50 years in prison. The surviving cult members who were arrested were tried, convicted, and sentenced to 30 years in prison. To this day, Magdalena Solis holds the distinction of being one of the few female Mexican serial killers that had a sexual motivation. Given when Magdalena and Elia Sar were convicted, they would have come up for parole in 2013. There are no records, however, of whether they were denied, paroled, or even died in prison. There are some reports that Magdalena did, indeed, die in prison, but those are unconfirmed. The fate is unknown for the 12 convicted cult members, as well. This was a bizarre and tragic story. We'll deliberately avoid the very sensitive subject of religion and any parallels in this story to modern religion and jump right to Magdalena. While she was clearly a depraved monster, we can't help but ponder how much of her life's circumstances of helplessly living in poverty and being forced into prostitution at age 12 contributed at least in part to her becoming all consumed by her newfound role of power. It obviously doesn't make it right by any means, but it makes it a little easier to fathom. What are your thoughts about this story and Magdalena? Do you think she was delusional before she met the Hernandez brothers? What would you have done if you witnessed what young Sebastian had seen? Please share your thoughts in the comments below. And if you like how we presented this case, we'd really appreciate you hitting like and definitely hit subscribe so you never miss a single video.